So, so I'm going to start the interview. So, uh, it, it's my very great pleasure to welcome Tony, aka the, the Surgeon, to uh, to Fever and to our shooting gallery show. And um, we're looking forward to uh, getting under the hood. Thank you for agreeing to this interview, mate. You're looking well. Hello. Yeah. You. It's it's good to see you. Yeah, and, and you're one of the most prolific producers. Um, you know, and I'm guessing like anyone else, it comes and goes with people, but you're fairly relentless, and you've kind of been non-stop over the last few years. So that that's a that's a vocation in itself. I just want, want to tip the hat there to to someone who can be prolifically interesting in his productions. Oh, thanks. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's something I really I work really hard at, and and uh, think a lot about. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess we're, we're put, gonna, yeah, I put a lot. I put a lot of effort into that. For sure. We're gonna we're gonna try and get under the hood of that. So I want you to obviously cast your mind back, and we were just having a little a little remembrance there about some early days in Dublin. What were you up to as a young teenager, musically listening to? What were your influences way before DJing, way before electronic music? What were what, what were you growing up on? What was what was surrounding your ears and what was catching your ears? Um, well, actually, actually, I would say that that some of my earliest musical memories were well you know here's the thing um it, it's it depends how you uh what you mean when you say electronic music and i think for me unfortunately a lot of people mean dance music and it's it's That's not true. exactly the same thing so for me that my my earliest musical memories were electronic music it was um there's a there's a japanese electronic composer called tomita yeah and he did he did electronic these really elaborate uh, electronic versions of uh, classical music, um, you know, like sci-fi themes, things like that. Yeah. Uh, but also, I remember like Laurie Anderson. Uh, my dad had these records from the BBC Radiophonic Workshop. So it was all this. I don't know. These. I didn't know it was electronic music, but I look yeah. back and I realise those are the things that really caught my ear. These very fantastical uh, kind of fantasy weird sounds whatever so that i caught How on you to were close to them it was, was it through your family through your father having a collection yeah i mean his whole it's not like his whole you know most of his collect, musical collection was really kind of bland easy listening to be honest <laughs> but i i seem to to zone in on these on these weird records he had yeah yeah uh without even realizing it and uh yeah i was just really drawn to them and i don't know i remember listening to like sound effects records i was just really into sound you you know yeah the, what, what you can do with sound so that's something that's been with me uh i don't know since i was like five six or something like that really i would say yeah yeah so you're, you're a sonic explorer from a young age yeah yeah for sure um, i mean way before you know and i i i really i loved uh this kind of weird English underground of bands like Coil and Throbbing Gristle, you know, people, they kind of say, oh, that's industrial. But I mean, I didn't really connect with, for example, the, the American version of industrial, like uh, Nine Inch Nails or Ministry or something. That was too kind of rock for me. I liked, like you say, this Sonic Explorer thing. So, yeah. you know, when, when techno came along, it kind of, merge with my interest in that really so it's a kind of continuum through so, that so explain to me then was you know obviously growing up um in, in the uk you were exposed you know did you get into the band scene were you into the, interested in the live scene or were you just exploring records per se and and, and music that, that you could find on the radio or, or other sources yeah i mean i don't know when i when i was a teenager i was like really into like the smiths and the cure and whatever yeah. you know that kind of stuff um the 80s i story. really what's that <laughs> Good 80s trade. Yeah, but you know, I really, I really, I was a huge, huge fan of this band called Spaceman 3. I don't know if you know. They you know, done, um, yeah, they done a couple of, or were remixed a couple of times in the 90s. I do remember the name. Yeah, yeah I mean, they they kind of split off into like Sonic Boom and and Spiritualized. Um, but you know, they were they were almost like a local band because I li I grew up in Northampton and they were from Rugby, which is almost. Yeah, you know, next door, and they played in Northampton a lot. So, and they they were really influenced by like the Stooges and Suicide, Velvet Underground. I was a big fan of Velvet Underground as well. So I I love this idea of drone and repetition. Yeah, you know, so that that's all part of you know what techno is. And and, and uh, was there 
a defining moment, a defining song or record. Um, were you started, well, I guess even before that, were you starting to build up your own kind of collection or were you just interested in seeking out sound still? Or was there a well, record, was there a record it, buying phase? It was, well, it was difficult in the beginning because I had no money. I hadn't, I, I, could, I literally couldn't afford to buy records, you know. It's, yes. um, but a friend of mine, the only friend I ha had at the time who had a job, <laughs> he bought lots of records so so you know it was all it was just through what records my friends had yeah really and i remember he used to he used to tape john peel john peel's radio show every time and at that time peel was playing like belgian rave and um underground resistance jeff mills stuff like that you know and that's how i got to hear about that stuff through through John Peel's radio show. Because that was my next question. So was there a moment when you discovered, you know, electronic dance music per se? And, you know, what, what was that moment? But I guess, you know, I, I was aware of Peel. I, we didn't really get the BBC over here. So, um, but obviously the John Peel story is well documented. I, I would be aware, you know, how he broke Joy Division and some certain influential bands. Um, and I, I know he dabbled with the electronic style. I wasn't aware that it was the underground resistance. He, well, he 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 played honestly anything good. He played it. Yeah. He he was and he uh, he got it. He was you know he wasn't just some weird old guy trying to be cool <laughs> or something. You know he really you know I mean before he died he was like breaking like grime and stuff like that and he was yeah. just really passionate about it and just championed so many bands so many sounds. Yeah, there's just no one like him, really. I mean, me, I, I, I've, I've done sessions on his show with Regis, and you know, it's, yeah. it's great. He, he really supported our sound. Did that make you move towards obviously listening to these sounds and being interested sonically? Um, was the production thing something that grabbed you then from a young age, or was it the DJing thing, or what came first? I, I, I had already uh, dabbled with. Uh, making music but it was very sort of avant-garde it was like really influenced by uh I, I was really really influenced by um this film i saw um it was uh, a william burroughs film and it was called the cut-ups and it was like this technique uh, it's a very famous technique uh, developed by brian geisen and kind of popularized by william burroughs about taking something and cutting it up and reassembling it and it's this uh it's the essence of sampling in, in that Yeah, thing. yeah, exactly, you know, and I saw this film and it blew my mind because, you know, when you're young and you, for me, see, being young and seeing something, you know, uh, done in a way I'd never seen or, or imagined before, it's like, it changes your whole universe. Mind is blown. This, this, mo this moment, defining moment. And yeah, and so that was a huge, yeah, William Burroughs, the cut-ups, that kind of idea, it was a huge influence. So I, I got really into uh, tape collage, tape editing. Yeah. I looked out for the cat. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, <laughs> yeah, and, um, and yeah, and so my first music was... Um, M mashups and sampling on tape. Well, not, not, not like dance mashups. I mean, they were very, it was like really gnarly. It was more like throbbing gristle or someone, you know, it was very kind so of you weren't, doing, you weren't doing the mixtape era now for trying to impress girls or anything? Uh, yeah, I mean, I did that too, yeah. But I mean, the first, the first music that I, I, I made myself was, you know, with a four track tape recorder and, uh, uh, you know, a quarter inch reel to reel editing tape, things like that. So, well, so yeah, I'd, I'd made music before I got into performance. I got into techno. Yeah, yeah. So, did, did, I'm guessing then you were always playing around. Was there any formal training, anything that you did to improve your musical skills, or were you just basically one of those guys that likes to get under the hood sonically of, of, of pieces well, of music, see what you can I think, do? I think, like when I was when I was growing up, I I always knew I loved music. So, so the obvious the obvious um, so the obvious um, path is to learn an instrument. Yeah, I tried learning loads of different instruments and never really got on with any any of them. I, it's like, it's like, say, I, I tried to learn the piano, but I was more interested in opening it up and like <laughs> picking the strings and I don't know, making, playing it not how you're supposed to. And I didn't have the patience to learn it in a, in a formal way. Yeah. Can so tell. I kind of gave up on that. But then uh, after school in, North, when I finished school in Northampton, I, I, I moved to Birmingham 
to go to a technical college to learn. It was a the course was audio visual design, but it, but part of it was sound engineering, and that yeah. was like the closest thing I could find that I that, that, would, that would accept me. <laughs> um, you know, because yeah, I didn't like come out of school with a whole load of like exam results and stuff. But I I went to this technical college to learn sound engineering. And I did learn a lot of stuff there, but I also learned I didn't want to be a sound engineer. <laughs> I was like, no, nah, this, this isn't for me. But I, I, liked, I liked the technical aspects, you know, and at that time, remember at that time, all of the gear was totally out of our, our budget. Yeah. We couldn't afford a single piece of that gear. It was so expensive, but it actually gave me a chance to get my hands on it, you know. And I didn't have a lot of time, but at least I got to like, Touch some expensive. Gear. <laughs> I'm guessing we're talking late eighties. Um, yeah, this was like eighty nine. And what, what, what then? Obviously, when did you start getting your hands on some bet, bits of kit, I guess, or a sequence, or, or you know, what was the first kind of moment where you were able to work with some kind of a computer system, or not, or how did you record initially? Well, the computer came later, but the the the, the equipment. Uh, yeah, that really was like early 90s. It was like I lived in a shared house and all of us had various bits of basic gear and we just put it all together, you know. And I, I, yeah. think, I think I had something where when I finished college, I got, I, I qualified for some sort of very small grant to cover, uh, I don't know, the, the cost of doing the course or something like that, the materials, you know, the tape and things like that. So, so I, I, I think I bought I bought some some crappy keyboard with that, and you know a friend had a drum machine, and someone else had this, you know, and we just we just pulled. It's like friends pulling gear together, and just that's yeah. how the first the first uh, releases came from that that gear. Because um, you must have been though in party mode and in college days. Did you get up to any of the hacienda events or anything that was going on around that part of the UK? No, I. Um, there, there were there were events I went to regularly in Birmingham, and sometimes me and some friends would take a coach down to London and go to an all-nighter. Yeah, but you know I was just absolutely flat broke back back then. You know I didn't I barely yeah I mean even just to pay for a bus down to London you know I didn't really have yeah spare spare money for that. So um, I mean a lot of the time we we. It was very DIY, you know, we couldn't really afford to go. We knew that there was parties happening, but we just made our own thing, but we kind of made it up as we went along. And <laughs> it's like, you you have the idea of what a techno night is. This is this is how this night House of God started. Yeah. Um, we had the idea of what a techno night was, but it actually wasn't like that. You know, <laughs> the way we did it, it was way more varied musically and stuff like that. And, yeah, um, yeah. So we just, yeah, we just made, made, you know, made our own things because because you were one of the um, one of the first kind of UK techno producers to start outputting, I guess, in the early nineties. Would, would that have been around the time frame when when you actually? Yeah, started I mean, there, I mean, before you know, there there was there was definitely a wave of producers before you know. Oh yeah, um, yeah. Like Dave, you know, Dave Clark had releases way before me. Luke Slater, people like that, you know, Space yeah. DJs. There's there's a whole load, whole load of people. And, and Slam, was it Soma? Yeah, that yeah. You, did you get signed to Soma? Was that the first label, or was there another label? Uh, and that was an early release. I did a like one twelve inch, an early yeah. called Mugger Scum Out for them. But uh, the first, my first releases were on Downwards, okay. uh, uh, Regis's uh, label. Yes, yes. And that, that uh, Regis, then you've done a lot of collaborations with Regis in the early days, I think. Uh, well, I mean, uh, I. He released my music, but it, it was like a little later on into like the early 2000s that we actually um, made music together. I mean, okay. we, we did a lot of gigs together, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I just remember from, from the time of seeing the names on, on the vinyl. Um, tell me, I mean, let's fast forward a little to, to you then. Obviously, a big question, the name. Where did the name come from? Oh, right. Oh, yeah. One. Um, Actually, going back, I, I, one point I, I really want to make is that I really never set out to be uh, a techno DJ. You know, I, I, 
yeah, I didn't like the idea of like being on stage or in a spotlight or something like that. You know, like I said, I wanted to be a sound engineer. I wanted to be one of these people in the background working with gear and stuff like that. So it was really something that that happened without me kind of wanting it to. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean that's definitely a, a point I want to make about all all of this. You know, I, I didn't I didn't set out to. Yeah. It just sort of it just kind of happened to me really I guess, I guess it's probably because you're outputting music and back in the day they you know they needed those those music that music was breaking in the clubs they wanted a face behind that music so yeah you probably landed in in your first couple of DJ gigs unintentionally yeah I mean well I mean a strange way of putting it Birmingham I mean originally the stuff in Birmingham I I actually wanted to run the chill out room <laughs> uh, at, at, at part of the parties that my friends me and my friends were doing I wanted to hope to run the chill out room that was my but I think uh, that fell through for some reason so yeah I, I, I played in the techno room instead and was it a trial by fire had you a little bit of experience on the turntables uh, not a, not a lot at first. I mean, like one one friend had some turntables, and I would go around his house. Uh, yeah, Paul Bailey, Paul Damage. Make, make a bit of oh yeah, I remember Paul Damage. Yeah, and he, you know, he 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 had these turntables because he he comes from like a hip hop DJing background because he's you know scratching and cutting and stuff. So yeah, I would go around his house and like learn, try and learn how to mix on those. <laughs> but but no other medium to practice in between. No, no, no! You just, you just, you, just you wing just it. Pick some <laughs> records and just play them. <laughs> <laughs> that's, but well, that, that's, that's the essence of pure techno back in the day, I guess. You just yeah. I mean, but I it. still, I still really go. I, you know, my my whole attitude remains like that. You know, stand up there and start and just figure it out. You know. Yeah, yeah. I like, have, I like have that. A start point. That, have that a start kind point. of that, that sheer terror to, to <laughs> drive, drive your performance. Um, you were going to come to the title. I mean, how did you come up with the surgeon name? Uh, was there other names? I'm guessing there may have been. No, um, I think the very first flyer said the surgeon, but I quickly dropped the. <laughs> and but that was it. You know, I mean, really, I, I this is a question I've answered many different ways. But honestly, unfortunately, there's not a really exciting. Uh, answer to it, you know, it's like at the time you just pick a name. Okay, so you know, early 90s, every DJ DJed under a, a ridiculous name. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, me and my friends, we're DJing, so we're going to pick names. It was like, you know, we're kind of taking the piss, really. <laughs> you know, yeah. and and you pick a name and you don't think really much of it because it's, it, it, you know, you don't, I never of course, I never thought that I'd be using it 30 years later, you know. Yeah. I'm glad, I'm glad I didn't pick a really terrible... <laughs> it could have been a lot worse, I think. Yeah, absolutely. It could have been, it could have been anything ridiculous, you know, and that, that would have killed it straight away. But it somehow, um, yeah, I don't know, it kind of worked, so yeah. I, tell, me, I, tell me about your early process in the music making. Um, your, your sound was quite hard-edged, um, and it was very kind of... It stood out a little bit as being that kind of hard edge sound, but tell us about your own production process in that. And you, you alluded to it a little bit earlier on that obviously to remain consistent, you have to kind of put in those the quality control on your side. But I mean, back in the day, you were probably just trying to get the tracks done and output, and it was a bit more freestyle. But you, you definitely you definitely developed a sound for yourself quite early on. And um, how did that come about, or was it just accidental? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was just like, it was really, it was really punk, really. It was just like using uh, old crappy, obsolete bits of gear. Um, and just, you know, there was such a, there was such a, a crazy uh, energy at the time. I'm just, I was just trying to express that really and capture that, you know, in the clubs that I was playing. And it was just a pure reflection of, you know these house of god events and stuff like that you know it was it was just insanity yeah i was just trying to like capture that sound but you know it's like over years as i you know different different periods it's like i uh you know if i feel like i've kind of captured or nailed a certain sound or feeling i, I then it's done for me it's yeah. it's done you know and then I, I i'm look i look for something else and i and it also comes with 
to the way that I make the music. You know, if I start feeling too comfortable, I'll change the way that I make the music because uh, I don't, yeah, I don't want it to be comfortable. You know, I want it to challenge me and, and the people who, who listen to it. It definitely does invoke an edginess um, and an energy because it's very easy to overcrowd records, you know, and you kind of have that nailed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which, which, which is kudos to yourself. So you, you've kind yeah. of maybe it's being of... impatient. <laughs> <laughs> Move on. Next, next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm really impatient. You know, I, I'm. That's, that's, that's. Yeah, yeah, that's part of it. I think. Your good friend on the Irish side, uh, our, our techno ambassador Francois, was uh, was asking for you. And I was doing a set with Francois a couple of weeks ago. Okay. Oh, um, and we were talking about some of the some of the kitchen days, and so you mentioned how I've been speaking to yourself. Tell me about coming to Ireland and, and playing over here for the first time, the energy and, and what you remember, was it any different? Was it just an extension of what you were used to? Uh, because you became a fairly regular feature here in, in the late 90s. Yeah, um, I mean, yeah, there there are similarities and differences. I mean, the, uh, you know, I, I love the whole time that I played um, in Ireland. I. You know, I always love it just because the there's just you know that energy is there, and it's it's uh, you know it's it's on a level with kind of uh, particularly the north and sort of mid Midlands and north of England is, but you know it's it, it's different as well. It's really, but it's yeah, I it's hard for me to sort of pinpoint and describe you know a yeah yeah feeling or, or whatever, but um, you know it's something. Yeah, I mean, I feel closer to it than, say, if I play in Germany or Spain or something, you know. Yeah, yeah, I guess it's a different sense. Th there is a different energy as you move around, I guess. Yeah. I mean, the, the kitchen nights, the JDP nights, Jason's nights, um, go down as legendary because, again, I guess at that time, as I said to you, like we were kind of coming out of the house and progressive house scenes and techno then, stepped up the underground techno really stepped up in dublin and the kitchen was at the forefront of that they had a tuesday night techno called genius and you guys had the friday night and it, it just established a very very solid base and back then people were going out clubbing seven nights a week somehow i don't know how they managed to get the energy but i'm sure there was <laughs> i'm sure it was enhanced yeah <laughs> but um it, it was it was a great time you know great to be alive and be part of that uh you, i mean you were one of the jdp residents um, was there? Did you play any other? other I know the festival thing hadn't really kicked off then. I think some of our first festivals happened later than that. But was there any other big, big events that you played around Ireland or up north, or any other big memories for yourself? Uh, I mean, mo I mostly played in. I mostly played in Dublin and uh, and and occasionally in Belfast, but but more more off the most often in Dublin for sure. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I, I, yeah, I've got, I've got, yeah, I don't know how many, it would be interesting to know how many times I've actually played in Dublin, because it's quite a lot. It, it, it is, yeah, it was it was almost every, definitely a monthly for a little while. I, I must, must look into that, we can we can have a look, I'm sure the Flyer, flyer Archives are there. I, I'll talk to Jason, I haven't seen Jason in a long time, but he, he would be the man to know. Tell me about the productions then over the years, I mean, you remain very true to style, but I'm sure you, being, being yourself, you probably get bored with certain sounds and go on and off, go on and off the button. How do you keep it interesting for yourself? I, I know there's a lot of sonic exploration always there, but it, it's very easy when you're dealing with just a couple of elements to say, nah, it's not happening. Um, yeah, I mean, I think what I'm, uh, I guess what I'm interested in, what kind of turns me on, it, it changes over the years and I, I, I somehow, in a subtle way, try to draw that into 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 the music I'm making. But you know, it it goes into probably more so into the music I'm DJing. Yeah, you know, I I really you know I've all I, I've I've always seen myself as as being not not a pure techno DJ mm. you know I really I I wanna I want to mix in everything I like you know from uh, some old Chicago house you know that that's a, yeah. you know I mean the thing is about my productions you hear this kind of 
this high energy and this harshness. But there's a, for me, there's a huge influence with Chicago House, this, this raw stripped down stuff, the syncopation. Yeah. But that's really important to me. I'm, I, I, I'm really not into this, like, just a massive kick drum. Yeah, that's just like deathly boring for me. I, I love the rhythm and the syncopation. And that's what that's what excites me about. I, th I think that's probably the Minim minimalism as well. I, I think that's probably the the secret of success you just nailed there. It, it, it retains interest, you know. It remains interesting on the ear because it has that movement going on at, at the bottom end. Yeah, yeah, and that's yeah. what makes that's what makes me want to dance. A, a big kick drum doesn't make me want to. <laughs> dance. It's, it's all the stuff dancing around the kick drum. That's that's what I'm interested yeah. in. And how how is modern the, the techno train? I mean, the techno train has evolved greatly over over, especially at the moment. Um, how are you finding kind of the, the overall sound of techno? Because your your sound still remains true to your own, but obviously you have to DJ with some other styles, some other records. Well, I mean, no matter what, no matter what happens, I always play. Uh, the music that's exciting me and I, I have to say at the moment uh, there's a great deal of music oops there's a great deal of music coming from a lot I'd say from a lot of like what you could call Bristol producers who, uh, who I'm really really the home of trip hop well maybe <laughs> and, and, at one stage at some one other stage. things but um <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so, so you know, to me, what they're doing is techno, but their 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 palette and their rhythm rhythm structures are just like really, really exciting and inventive. And I love I love to mix some of that kind of music with more yeah uh, straightforward kind of techno stuff. But um, you know, that's what's really exciting me at the moment. I, I think that's kind of ring true in your sets. Um, you know, you do try and drive for that that interesting energy. And even if you're only dealing with a couple of sounds, they have to be the right sounds that's working there. Um, tell me how COVID affected you creatively. Um, you, know, you know, it's not been easy for any of us. Obviously, everyone lost work and lost events. But did you hit any roadblocks in your production style, in in your outputs, or was it? Did you feel it in a positive way? Uh, yeah, it, it was, yeah, it wasn't positive at all. It, <laughs> it, it uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it was and, and s still is basically. Yeah, it's, it's been an, it's been a terrible time really. Yeah. And um, I mean, it's, it's difficult to say, uh, a lot more than that. I mean, I've definitely not been, I've not felt at all like creative or, or yeah. anything like that, you know? I mean, um, yeah, this, you know, the, the, the situation in the world has not made me, uh, <laughs> put me in a creative place. Yeah, and, and that's good to know because I've, speaking, I've been speaking to a few others and it, it's affected everyone. Some people just say, right, I'm going to lock myself in and make music, but then you've no way of road testing that music and you've no way even to play it at, 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 during, the, during the hard lockdowns. It hasn't been easy for a lot of people. But yeah, you, you are remaining busy. Um, tell us what's going on currently and in, in the near future for yourself. You are due to be in Dublin this weekend. Is that still going ahead? Uh, oh yeah, I mean, I was, time. <laughs> I was supposed to come. I was supposed to play in Dublin tomorrow. Yeah. And they, I think, like didn't yesterday. It was announced that that all events had to shut at midnight. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, they decided to postpone this one till next year. Okay. Uh, so, so, some of the clubs are opening earlier and they're doing evening clubs, but I, I'm sure the government will probably latch onto that as being a high risk factor. So it's, it's not helping anything. I wasn't sure whether that was going. But yeah, to, to jump to the positive, I guess, what's what's coming up your side between now and the end of the year or that kind um, of thing? Um, well, I mean, I'm quite looking forward to on Sunday night, I'm DJing at, uh, at an opening of a club in Berlin whose name I can't <laughs> don't know how to pronounce. Uh, let me let me let me have a look. Re Reverse Sudest. Okay. Yeah, that's not that's not it at all. <laughs> anyway, but um, I'm actually playing after Sun Hill Chart, so that'll oh, be nice. Oh yeah, yeah Sun Hill's a good guy, and he he's the one flying the flag here, lobbying. The Absolutely, government. yeah, he's doing he's doing a great job. It's really it's it's great to have someone 
who's just relentlessly like <laughs> just hammering away at them. <laughs> Come on, you fuckers! I, I think Sunil will be our first techno president here. I think yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> At techno, you know, techno politician, for sure. I, I'm, I'm going to push Francois forward as, as his treasurer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, listen, it's been great to chat to you. Tell great, me, yeah. tell me what's coming up musically. Um, is there anything exciting that you're working on, albums or, or, or EPs? Anything that that's um, that's coming imminently that we can that we can help break for you over here? Um, well, I'm looking for new music. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, to be honest, uh, I, I've been doing very little in the way of productions for for a while now. I mean, the last the last releases I had were the two 12 inches on um, Ilian tape. Oh one yeah, was last year and one was the year before. Okay. But you know, I mean, I've just been recently. I've just been focusing, you know, because things have opened up in in some countries, and I've really just been focusing on 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 preparing for gigs that's yeah, what yeah. all my time has been going you know i've been doing some live sets so so i've been preparing those well that, i was going to come to that you, you must have enough back catalog there to do kind of a lot a lot of either live work and or or reworks of that as well yeah i mean but well the thing is when i my the 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 thing the big thing i've been in really into for quite some years now when it comes to performing live is is uh, is really about improvisation so i'm not i'm not like performing my hits or, or whatever yeah. whatever they <laughs> might be but, uh, no no uh, i i love you know that's that's something really special to me and and hopefully for the audience as well is 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 you know creating something Around oh you, like there and then, in front of people, and they get to be part of that, and it's it, yeah, it creates a really unique energy that's very different from DJ. And, and what's in the what's in your live setup as a basic? Um, tell me what sort of kit you have there in front of you. Uh, well, I I I change stuff quite frequently when I get new ideas, but there's uh, there. I mean, I've been using. Um, there's a drum machine made by uh, this Russian company called Soma, and it's called a Pulsar 23. And what is it? Um, I saw them advertise. I think they're launching something new. That could be the one you're talking about. Yeah. But, but yeah. So I've been using that and the various other sort of bits, bits and pieces. But yeah, I mean, it change. You know, it just changes with the wind, like my ideas. <laughs> <laughs> And, but you're, are you using the computer in the mix, or is it all trying? You're trying no, to no, no, no. I, I mean, I when I, you know, like five or so years ago, when I when I really started on this live thing, I was I, I had like some modular gear and and, and the laptop. Yeah. And gradually, the laptop just get got edged out. And literally, I, the last gig I had the laptop. Literally, all it was doing was telling me what the time was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, and I was like, you know what? It's time to get rid of that. <laughs> A watch. So, you can buy a watch. Yeah, yeah, buy a watch. <laughs> it's, it's cheaper. It's, yeah. Uh, Tony, it's such a pleasure. Last question. What advice would you give to anyone new that's coming up and, and wants to break into the market? It's a different world and it's an oversaturated world, but you know, what's your nugget of advice in, in following in, in, um, in a path? Well, uh, <laughs> what would I say? I, I want to say something along the lines of. Uh, like figure out what you want to do, what you want to do, fuck everyone else, figure yeah. out what you want to do and just be really stubborn and stick to it. Well, that's a, that's a great bit <laughs> of advice. <laughs> that you'll either win or lose badly with that advice. Yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> you, you, need, you need a healthy amount of delusion to, to like yeah. to make it. I think that's my number one tip: is be be stubborn and delusional. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll either you'll either end up on the on the street, or 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 you'll make it. Yeah. But I can't tell you which of those. But it'll be one of them. But you have to <laughs> sit. On that, you have to sit on that fence. <laughs> Listen, Tony, it's been such a pleasure. I really enjoyed yeah, that. It's been chat. great, man. Thanks. Uh, I'm looking forward to catching up when you're next over here. We, we'll have a chat in the new year. We'll have a point, uh, an overdue point with Francois and Sunil. Great. All right, nice one. Take nice care. Nice one, Tony. Thanks a lot, mate. Bye. Cheers, bye-bye.